All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning into the Barbell Medicine YouTube channel and listening to our podcast. This is episode number 28. This is the Q&A part two from the Barbell Medicine seminar held in Tempe, Arizona earlier this year. I've linked part one in the bio, so make sure to check that out. Thanks again for tuning in. See you guys soon. And then the more and more I read and I learn, and the way we structure it too in the gym is strength programming. But as I get new lifters, you know, lifters who then move on from, like you guys said, novice progression or whatever, it's tough for me to figure out how to run the business, right, to um, keep those people getting better, you know, as well as you have new lifters and still feel good about, like, putting up programming and that kind of stuff. Like, I just get confused on how to do all of that and still, like, I don't want to just run a gym for the sake of getting people in, giving them a good workout, but it gets tough with the more people that join, and uh, it's hard to. Do you guys, guys cross the gym? No, no, it's a strength and conditioning gym, but there's classes. Yes, do cross the gym. We don't do cross it. She just wanted. What? I mean, we do some like. Well, you there, say, there's. Like, I would say some of the. Like what? <laughs> well, so so what I'm getting at is, if you push a sled for a few rounds and then you combine that with kettlebell swings, is that CrossFit? I mean, I, I, don't I well, I don't know either. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. What if you do back squats before that, and then that's the conditioning for your class, or just sled intervals? Is that CrossFit? Well, I don't know. Mm-hmm. If that's CrossFit, then that's fine. But I don't know where it stops or where it starts, mm-hmm. right? So if it's just Metcons only, and that's what you're limiting CrossFit, then I don't like it. But if it includes everything, CrossFit is everything, CrossFit's nothing at the same time. <laughs> All right, so now I got out what I want to say. For you. <laughs> So it sounds like you are responsible for the programming of all the people who come into your gym. Yes. And, and that's where, yeah, it's getting very And so it's difficult because of the number of people you're in charge of? Or? Uh, the number of people and the levels, because it used to just be a program across the board, right? Sure, yeah. And then as that's changing and as I want to be a good strength coach. Right, so you realize like, that you yes. need to provide more, as people get more advanced, they need more individualized programming. Mm-hmm. Yes. And you have a large number of people at varying levels. Yes. And so, are they receiving this programming as part of their gym membership? Yeah, they would come there for the program. But now I have clients who are approaching me individually. I see. So that's kind of the issue I'm running into. Is that a moral thing in my own head? Is that what? That you don't know how to program for them? Uh, well, or the more I learn, the more I know really? I need to learn program. You yes. know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is this is a this is an important thing to point out because I've had a number of people this weekend who came up to me and talked to me about how they've realized because we basically opened the fire hose of information on you guys all weekend, right? You, I would, it would be great if you all could go home and retain, I don't know, 20% of what we presented this weekend because of how much information we presented. So it is very easy to put out information, answer questions very confidently and directly and clearly when you don't know very much, right? So Jordan got criticized for this recently. Someone said, Jordan doesn't ever answer a training question directly without saying he needs more information. That's true. Right? And so you all now recognize what the problem is, is that we know a lot of things (laughs) that we we know too much (laughs) that that influences what our answer is going to be, right? So all this stuff is complicated. And so he was saying basically that he, the more he learns, the more he realizes he has to learn. Well, and he okay. has a group of trainees in his gym that need more individualized programming, right? So do you find that the primary issue is a knowledge deficit or a time deficit that you don't have time to do individualized programming for all these people? Or what is the primary issue there? Because here, here are the solutions. Number one, it's a knowledge deficit. Well, that just means you need more experience, more knowledge, you know, uh, and, and and you'll get better with this stuff over time. Even with your own training experience, mm-hmm. Alan can teach you stuff, like that'll improve over time. Mm-hmm. It's a time deficit because you have so many members and you cannot provide them with individualized programming. Well, that's a logistical problem, in which case you probably need to raise your prices for this program sure. to make it a manageable situation for you. Because if all these people want individualized programming and you can't keep up with what's going on, you need to charge more. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But you guys think that it's right in the fact of that people need more individualized programs for progression? Uh, well, yeah. I, 
Okay. Yes. It for the most optimal sort yes. of uh, return on investment. Sure. Mm -hmm. Now look, most people who are coming to you who are training, I think you're talking about group training. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it'd be small group training. Yeah. So these people, oh, there's nothing wrong with them. They're great people, right? You like them, I like them. Fine. But these aren't the people who are like, look, I'm going to the IPF World Championships in six months. I need this program for the most weight on my squat. Right. My They're looking for improvements, sure. And you need to provide them with a quality product, sure. I'm going to make the argument that most programming ends up looking more similar than dissimilar provided similar goals. You see what I'm saying? So if someone wants to get stronger, gain more muscle, we know that they need to gain more muscle to get stronger anyways, and they need to do some conditioning because they want to either keep some base level of conditioning or they have a sport or they want to lose body fat, which this is, okay, I just described 95% of all people paying for coaching in the entire United States, all right? So you know it's going to look fairly similar. Mm -hmm. I think most good strength coaches and us certainly have certain templates that we'll start from or organization of training that we'll start from and then change certain parameters based on a person's training history or different goals or different uh, abilities, right? So I think what you would have is like, just very, very simple. You'd have a, okay, novice, like brand new, here's what I want to have you do. Post novice, you like you just graduated, here's what I'd have you do. And then a, a, a third program, and that's your template. And you're like, okay, now this is for you, the individual, I'm gonna tweak this, tweak this, tweak this, tweak yep. this. And that's what you do. So it consolidates your time, so you still you still are, are spent getting paid enough for the time you're spending on this, and it doesn't paralyze you. Right. And, and what you will do then, because you're now your scientist, is you're going to end up having multiple groups, and then you're going to do A B testing. You're going to be like, is this the best thing I could have these people on? I'm going to put this group from they think they're about the same. I'm going to put them on this certain program, and I'm going to tweak this other variable on this one. And I'm going to see does one do better than the other? Oh, they did. Well, now I'm going to do this and change another variable right. and see. That's basically what we do with our group programming thing because it's a similar setup. We have a group of people that sign up, stratify them by level. They get they, that group by based on their assignment. They get a particular program. We follow them over over time, and then as the next group signs on for that same thing, make adjustments over time based on the results. So yeah, in in the situation that you are in, where you are programming for large groups of people, you are going to. It's not going to be possible for you to hyper individualize things. Yep. That's why you charge more for that. Mm -hmm. That's why everybody charges more for a true one-on-one -on -one, hyper individualized program, us included, compared to group program a little less, compared to templates that are not at all like, you know, customized, individualized, fancy stuff like that. And those are yeah. the least expensive. Right. So yeah, that was a lot of information throughout this whole seminar, so I feel like I have a lot of questions, but I don't know. Rattle them So first one to go over, uh, so I know a lot of other starting strength coaches recommend people, no matter where they're at, to just go straight back to novice linear progression. Oh, well, if you like a period of not training? If I were to hire them as my coach, right away they're gonna put me on novice linear progression. I would not do that if you have evidence that I believe, which suggests you're no longer responsive to that type of training. That's improper management of training and is stupid, to be more blunt. So. Because the argument could be that it might sensitize you to what training again, or that if you're not it training, would milk out any extra gains you missed from the novice linear progression. Because I've never done it, so I'm finding the novice strength, LP. Yeah, same. I'm starting <laughs> starting strength like a lot later. Like I'm finding out, sure, sure. Like oh, I should have done LP. So maybe I'm missing out on a lot of gains. Maybe you're my not. squat could be a lot higher. No, you're not. Right so now. do you think that if you stop what you're currently doing, having me having watched you pull? Mm -hmm this weekend. Do you think that if you stopped what you're doing now, went back and did a novice program containing far, far, far less stress than what you're doing now, that you would in a reasonable amount of time significantly surpass your current level of performance compared to what you would get if you just kept doing what you're doing? I don't really think it could, and that's why I've never hired right. those coaches right yeah. away. Well, so like, that lifting less is going to make me correct. stronger. So that's the thing. So that's what you're hiring a coach to evaluate that and then make proper training management decisions based on that. But instead you're getting an intern who's not qualified to do that. And if a coach decided to do that, they'd be wrong too. So we would not put you. I wouldn't you put you on a novice progression. You and having seen you this weekend. 
and knowing your current training history and background would not put you on a novice program. Right. A, a good coach would not put you on a novice progression. They'd put you on the bridge and then lie about it. <laughs> so follow up question. <laughs> follow up question. Like when would you put somebody on a novice linear progression if they have had previous training uh, background? Is that like a year, two years, or if uh, it, if someone has actually been training in a model where there's progressive overload in, the, in that they're adding weight to the bar and on some regular metric, I'm not putting them on a novice LP. If they've been training before but haven't trained for the last month, for instance, they've been out of the country or look more, or they haven't trained because they had an injury for a long period of time, maybe I'll put them back on an LP just to like get their feet wet. But I'm not taking anyone who's been training, right, and applying less stress to them and assuming that they're gonna get a good result. I may not put them on a very complex program initially, sure, but I'm not having them do less and expecting them to get more. That's not how it works. There's no, there are no biological free lunches here, and I'm not just gonna de facto, you know, default to go on LP, no. Just like I'm not gonna reset somebody on LP more than one or two times, unless there's extenuating circumstances. These people wanna run LP forever. If you've been running LP, unmodified for longer than three months, I can assume one of two things. One, you're not training consistently. Two, you're a freak. You're an athlete on that spectrum. The only other considerations are that you change the program or the other two things, that's it. Like people do ice baths, yeah. you know, post-workouts or whatever, right. or say you sprain an ankle, you ice it. Sure. What's the purpose? So if you look at the evidence for doing ice baths after exercise, yeah. You get worse adaptations to training right. in general. Does that make sense to you now? Because of the natural response to training, which you are then blunting. Yeah. If you mega dose antioxidant vitamins, blunt your response to training. Yeah. There's a caveat with the ice baths, and like if you were to take ibuprofen, for instance, well, ibuprofen probably doesn't blunt your response to training. Uh, mega dose, you antioxidant stuff, but the ice bath thing. <clears throat> yeah, it may be true that the adaptation that you're getting is less from that training session, but if it's for performance, if you're at a competition, yep. then acutely taking your body temp, your central body temp, your core temperature down may improve your subsequent performance. And you don't care about the training adaptation, you only care about the performance next time. So if you have three three wads in a day at the CrossFit Games. Should you do an ice bath? Maybe. But if does doing an ice bath at home help you? No, it hurts you. It hurts you. Yeah. Does icing your ankle help you? Well, if it decreases your pain enough such that you can train again or compete again, sure. But otherwise, no. And since you brought up pain. <laughs> BRB, one hour lecture. <laughs> so the idea that you are suggesting is that the inflammation itself is the primary mediator of pain, which you now actually know is not the case, right? The, the acute inflammation that happens at a site of injury, what that does is that it sensitizes the nociceptors. So think about what that means. We've talked about sensitivity and resistance all weekend, so you should be comfortable with this idea. It makes the nociceptors more sensitive, so they fire more, send more signals up to your brain, and your brain then interprets that, as it usually does, and decides how much pain you feel, right? you put ice on something like that, if you, to the extent that ice does reduce inflammation, which I don't think is like a massive yeah. extent, right? Then it may serve to desensitize those, ner those free nerve endings a little bit. But the bigger thing that it's going to do to the extent that it helps you is that it's just a novel distracting stimulus at the site of injury, right? So what do you do when you stub your toe or you bang your knee against the table or something like that? You go, ah. You start doing this, right? What is that doing? Blood flow. No, it's not doing blood flow. Your blood, your, your knee is getting perfectly adequate amount of blood flow before you do this. Stimulating receptors. It's a, yeah, just stimulating receptors in a novel way. It's distracting your knee from the idea that it hurts. That's what that is. That's what you're doing with that effectively. To the, beyond whatever mild anti-inflammatory effect it might have. Yeah, just a novel stimulus. Which is the same argument that sometimes you hear when people are like, that's what happened. That is, the mechanism of spinal manipulation in chiropractic or getting acupuncture 
or getting any of those things. It's just some novel sensory stimulus that you're getting that somehow might throw a wrench in the wheel of that whole system. Maybe. Does that make sense? Does being in a calorie deficit move you along the spectrum or suggest certain variable changes? Uh, can. Not, if you believe it, that it will, it, it's certainly gonna affect you more. So really what you're compromising is your potential hypertrophic response to training. Now, can, will you gain some muscle mass as you lose body fat? Sure, a little bit. And the less trained you are, the more it's gonna be. Uh, but that's kind of the biggest thing there. What it means is you're gonna need more training to get less of a hyper, hypertrophic response. So to, to answer your question, yes. Um, and further, I think you told me that you've been running, you've run LP for a year now. Well, you're nine months overdue. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm serious, and I, I don't mean to say that in any sort of way other than mean that you've been needing more stress for a while, and I think you get a double whammy when you add more stress. So thing one, you get to burn more calories. That's cool. Thing two, you get more appropriate training stress, so your strength's gonna go up. So that's cool. And which will ultimately keep you more compliant on the diet because you're like, cool, things are going my way now. And a little, you get a little easier. So if it were me, what I would have you do is do something like the bridge with twice the twice weekly GVP from day one. Do that. Mainly because you've been training for so long already that I feel like your work capacity is, uh, that, that, that's appropriate for you. So I guess kind of his question too is that, um, minus the dietary stuff, the LP, if I've been on linear progression for four months, which I have, I started, Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. I typically train, I would say on average, two and a half times per week. Some weeks get three, some weeks get two. Just where my, my schedule works. I haven't got to the point yet with like the squats and deadlifts where I haven't been able to add weight every time I lift. Yeah. So my press, I'm down like one and a half, one point two five per lift, but it still goes up. Yeah. Bench press, still five pounds per lift every time. Yeah. So I don't know when I should go up to, let's say, a 12 week program if I'm still gaining on LP. And yeah, if I'm only probably not. Yeah. 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 So well, you may have. I mean, you may have started. Was when was your surgery? Was that a separate deal? Long time. Ten years. Long ago. time ago. Yeah. Okay. So that was. I want to make sure you weren't like starting up no. immediately post op. No. I think probably our suspicion is that you may have started a little light. I did. I did definitely. There you and go. Because I was trying to make form corrections then because I I keep I treat myself in the basement watching yeah most of his videos. So that explains how long you've been on it. Yeah. So just keep going. Yeah. Okay. You're fine. Fine. And I just I put a newsletter out. Uh, Friday about what to do when your upper body stalls and I would just run that as soon as your press stops going plug that in and then once your squat or deadlift or both stop then phew, off to the races something else so do you have to get down to the point where you're going like less than five pound increments on squats and deadlifts before you make the switch less than five pound well if you just if you're not able to add every 48 hours at that point I think you earn a new training but even adding like two pounds two and a half pounds well that means six pounds a week Okay. I can do better than that on an intermediate program. Not me personally, because I can't ever add weight to the bone apparently. I just, but I can do better than that for someone who's an intermediate. Okay. See what I'm saying? So somebody coming off LP, I plan on their squat going up five to 10 pounds every week. Okay. And you adding two pounds per session, even at six, I don't think it's gonna last long enough for me to want to yeah, prevent you from developing two weeks. To, my, to prevent you from developing the work capacity you're gonna need to go forward. Okay. Yeah. And if I'm not specifically looking to compete, more like just like hypertrophy and, and sports. Well then, you Twice. definitely need to move on at that point. Yeah, okay. Because <laughs> yeah. you again, out. you need to think, so so again, this is a short term program as an introduction to training. The uh, Most people who are interested in, really interested in this stuff are gonna be training for a long time, hopefully the rest of their lives. So you have to think about what are the necessary characteristics that we need to develop to improve their long term outcomes, right? Keeping your training dose as low as possible for as long as possible prevents you from limiting the things you need to develop to make the long-term progress you need, like work capacity, exposure to training volume, things like that. Does that make sense? Yep. So that's kind of our argument against the whole like minimum dose concept, is that you are training as heavy as possible with as little volume as possible for as long as possible, whereas you've noticed that the counter argument in terms of the ways based on the evidence <coughs> to develop those longer term characteristics involve training with slightly more submaximal intensities so not as heavy as possible training with gradually increasing training volume so training more than the minimum possible dose 
and doing that once your novice program has stopped working, right? The problem with training as little as possible, so, so the, minim, the whole concept of this minimum effective dose deal is that it's effective for what? It depends on what outcome you deem to be acceptable. So if an acceptable outcome is that your press goes up by a pound in two days, and you're do, doing the minimum amount of training so that your press goes up a pound in two days, that seems rather silly to us. In most gyms, that's within the error margin of the place it's you're using. More, less than the error margin. Yeah. 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 Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's why we're not fans of going to this like half a pound microloading bullshit, right? right? So train more. Alan Thrall said microloading is bullshit. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So we're fans of not the minimum dose of training yeah, for reasons right. that I we hope are clear after this weekend. I want you to try to overtrain. Try to overtrain. Yeah, you, try to overtrain. <laughs> you, might, you might just get too strong. So. We tried to overtrain once. Look what happened to us. Yeah. I accidentally got too strong. <laughs> you can't even move laterally. <laughs> um, regarding paleo diet and people with um, like ulcerative colitis and other issues like that, there's than people who have uh, claimed that it helps with that. Sure. Right. What What is your opinion? Or I don't think the evidence is particularly okay. compelling that the paleo diet is useful in any medical condition. Period. That being said, the subjective reports of pain or symptomology symptoms that are not verified via objective tests. I think are real reports by people who feel like they've had real benefits from this dietary intervention. I do know someone that's huge into it. She had these issues, went on it. She feels great now. Good yeah. for her. So. Yeah, that's pump. I'm pumped. Yeah. And so I don't. I wouldn't stop somebody from doing the paleo diet. My my thing is, I want to go off. I want to make sure that just because she's feeling better doesn't mean she's actually healthier. So if she starts the paleo diet and no longer eating any fiber. No, like you know, from whole whole grains or the sources that we were discussing that beta glucan or psyllium husk, and now her lipid panel goes crazy, right? That puts her at increased risk for something. If she gains weight because she's doing the paleo comfort food cookbook, well, just because paleo doesn't mean it's good for her. But if everything else is in line, that type of uh, uh, elimination diet has made her symptomology better. That's a win. That's cool. That's awesome. And I, I would certainly be open to trying that, particularly if someone had a high buy-in. Uh, to that type of diet, which you pick up in the nutritional history portion of like a, a client interview. Uh, but that being said, I am, I just don't think there's enough evidence to be that, for that to be my routine recommendation. You know what I'm saying? It's not that there's a bunch of evidence saying that it doesn't work for this. Sure. It's that this stuff, that we don't have randomized trials of this diet in various, in, in, in something like UC, for example. No. I know there are some trials of it in diabetics. Yeah. Uh, that's the extent of my understanding because well, I haven't looked into it in a while. The one, so Peter Tia and uh, oh, yeah, they funded that. that study. And then pulled, and then yeah. his, well, pulled his name off of it or whatever. Yeah, because it showed that it was harmful. Yeah. Anyway, but yeah, it would. I would be open to trying it. I would just again, I want to have a balance of subjective and objective evidence. So you see, there are a handful of things you're tracking objectively via lab and physical exam, and I would want to make sure those things are actually improving rather than just saying, "Oh, this diet, see." It, it's helpful. So, also consider more interesting stuff referencing the pain lecture. Yeah, sure. Talked about social learning, yeah. right? So, how do how do you think that could play into this? So, if she read a blog or read, she read hundreds of testimonials on a forum, yeah, paleo, yeah. right? That's she, like she's getting she's getting primed sure. for this intervention to result in more. Yeah. So, so again, we're not saying that this is not that she's that her symptoms being better is not real. Yeah. But we are kind of just hypothesizing for possible mechanisms for that because again, once you know more about all these things, things are not as simple as make X change that causes Y result. I mean, why can't you just explain general stuff to general things without needing more information? Yeah. That? Right. But. It's good. So now you're thinking more about this. It's like, oh, that's interesting. What if it was mediated by some other thing? Uh, her diet was a novel stress. That's what it was. She a, that's right. Yeah, you should try training. Colonic, summer. colonic, repeated bout of training. <laughs> you know, I had a girl ask me to go to a colonic on a date. Yeah, it sounds awesome. <laughs> you, you learn a lot about people, though. <laughs> um, all right. So, quick softball question and then 
Uh, softball question. Yeah. So, uh, like softball. Everybody wear no, like it's easy. So, possibly. So, uh, everyone wears knee sleeves when they squat. Would you say that that is a placebo? Makes my knee feel better. There's makes a component of that. What? There's a component of that. So why do why do people wear knee sleeves all the time? Or why do, why would you guys wear knee sleeves? Because I know you guys do. Feels good. Well, yeah. There's, <laughs> so, but if you have knee pain. There's some evidence that neoprene knee sleeves, especially from os- if it's from osteoarthritis, that it actually improves pain scores, it decreases pain scores, and makes people uh, more able to tolerate dynamic activity. Okay. So it doesn't store any mechanical energy, so it doesn't add any weight to the bar, but it also does give you some tactile feedback as far as where your knees are at in space. And so potentially, to the extent that can improve your proprioceptive kind of stuff. Yeah, your so movement the quality. But look, remember when I said, there is some quote unquote placebo component if you agree that various, that basically all symptoms that you could possibly experience and perceive are mediated by your brain. Every single intervention has a component of a placebo effect, right? So of course knee sleeves have a placebo effect on people, right? They may have some other real effect, eh, maybe. You know what I mean? Yeah. You'd, well, then you'd have to say that the mechanical model for certain things is, you know, terribly effective. And cool. plus, hey, I have ugly knees, bro. As long as you're and, not, uh, as long as so, so here's here's a potential problem, I suppose. If you have developed the belief that you must wear these knee sleeves to squat without pain, and then you go take a trip, and you have to squat without your knee sleeves. What happens? Good way to blow your knees out, bro. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's how you blow your knees out. I blew so, my knees uh, that's, out. <laughs> whatever <laughs> that means. <laughs> I blew them out. <laughs> Sideways. <laughs> my kneecap blew Does out. Does that make sense? Yes, definitely. So that's a consideration. Uh-huh. Uh, next question is going to be the gender reps. So changing your linear progression because nope. of gender. Because, so it doesn't matter anymore. Because you're saying that you're changing the goalposts a little bit, and that because nothing matters anymore. <laughs> well, so 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 the question is, if you are training women, should you switch them to five sets of three versus three sets of five? And I think that I would not uh, engage in that gender dichotomy. For this, I would say that if someone's less sensitive to training, right, that they're going to need more stress. Right? Will you get more stress by doing five triples at a heavier weight? Than three sets of five at a lower weight. Maybe I would a little say bit. No. But yeah, yeah, maybe a little bit, or maybe not, but maybe a little bit. Certainly, you would have less intra-set fatigue, and so potentially you could do more weight, and potentially you could that could accumulate over one training session, and that's a little more stress, and it worked for a little bit, a little bit. But I think that applies more to people who are training resistant than just women. There's some women who are more athletic than you and I combined and more uh, sensitive to training than you and I combine. But if you're training resistant, that may be a, a fine way to spend a few weeks of training, and then you just change. So he's saying there may be guys that you might 100%. do that right. for if you yeah. deem them to be anabolically resistant or training insensitive in the but, same way that you might for females in that case. But, if I had a female who, who failed on her novice progression, three sets of five, would I put her on five triples? Right. Uh, like the great talent scout of our time, Randy, once said, that's gonna be a no for me, dog. Like I wouldn't do that because we've already found out that that wasn't enough stress. I don't want to like just inch her stress up a little bit. Maybe I'm just going to add more okay. and just cover my bases. Cool. Let's move on. Same thing with the guy, right? The guy fails three sets of five. I'm going to switch him to five triples. Probably not. I see no reason to milk this out. Run it out. What is the benefit of that? The benefit of that is you don't have to have anybody who knows what they're doing from a coaching standpoint to do that. You could hire monkeys or interns. They can do. Right. Yep. So that's basically just like doing five three one kind of. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. A more effective yet still shitty version of five three one. <laughs> yes. So when I go to my doctor for my yearly checkup, he tells me I, at six feet tall I need to be around one hundred seventy two pounds or something like that. Yikes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like the BMI recommendations and everything to not be classified as overweight. If you guys are gonna get the. the medical community in general to recommend uh, strength training isn't that a huge part of what you have to disprove or or, or well, temper or something the current recommendation for people who have a, a bmi higher than 25 so also get a waist circumference on them and then you use that to risk stratify the person so if, what's your waist right now around your belly button uh, 
35. You're low risk. You I don't need to tell you to do anything. Care, carry on. And so your doctor really just needs internet access. Seems like that's the problem. <laughs> Could you laminate that on a card? So here's the thing. Here's, doctors. Yeah. Here's, here's the way that you can think about it. So in medicine, when we are looking, when we are screening for things, we do a screening test, right? Which is likely to generate a large number of false positives. That's what screening does. If it's negative, we feel very confident that you don't have this condition. Like if I'm gonna screen you for HIV, my test is gonna be very, very good at determining if you don't have HIV. Meaning that if it's negative, I'm like, cool, no further testing needed. If it's positive, a, screen, a good screening test will result in a large number of false positives. That's how these things work, which means you need to go to step two, a confirmatory test. In those people, a positive test tells you, yeah, this person actually has this condition. Okay, does that make sense? So that's the sequence of screening. So in HIV, we do a screening test, confirmatory test. When we do various other types of screening tests for a bunch of other conditions, mammograms or whatever, you screen, and then if it's a positive test, you go and you do your ultrasound or your biopsy or whatever you're gonna do afterwards to confirm whether this is a cancer or not, for example, right? So what he's describing is that sequence. We do BMI as a screening test that is good at telling you, hey, most people who are under 25 on their BMI, it's a good test of telling us, hey, this person is not obese, right? Or they're at not super high risk of mortality from their, from their body mass. But if it's above 25, you can see how we have some false positives. There are a large number of false positives currently sitting in this room. Yeah. At which point you move to your confirmatory test, which is a waist circumference, right? Okay. In a way. And if it's in an acceptable range, you say, yeah, you're good. Yeah. Right? So my BMI is like 28 and a half or something like that. Waist is fine. Also in the low to mid thirties or something like that. So fine. But the screening test is going to give you some false positives. So then you have to look into it further. You don't just stop at the screening test, right? That'd be like him checking an HIV test on you, getting a false positive, and then saying, well, looks like you have HIV. Okay, bye. Right? You need to go to step two. Yeah. Like, look at the guy. That's my step two, usually. It's just like, look at the patient, right? Uh, oh, they're super jacked. Well, okay, I'm not so worried about it. Do you diagnose them with super hyperjacketude? Hyperjacketude is <laughs> Hypergain meaning. <laughs> yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Why are training programs usually broken up into 12 week blocks? Yeah, more like more by default. Um, when I work with somebody one on one, uh, usually I'll program things. Well, to be fair, before a lot of it revolved around four week blocks, like four week blocks of things that I would just change things because I, uh, I you, the median amount of people would become less responsive to the training at the four week mark. Or at least that's what I would interpret from looking at all my clients. Not as far as that's accurate, you know, recall bias and all sorts of other confounding factors there. So, yeah, if I could take that back and and, and rerun some data analysis on that, maybe I'd be different. Um, so now, now usually I run the the higher volume development type blocks where hypertrophy is one of the main goals, as well as uh, uh, developing a, a good strength base, those usually run a little longer. Uh, so four, six, seven, eight weeks, and then the peaking or higher intensity stuff, two or three weeks, and there may be a pivot week in between, and an on, on one, and now you're at 12 weeks. So even though the block lengths are different, that's typically how I would do that. I don't think a peaking cycle should last longer than two or three weeks, and I find that most people are able to do some sort of volume work for productively for six to eight weeks, usually. So, but if the question wasn't what do I think works, the question was why are your bunch of programs 12 weeks? Look man, people like 12 week programs, okay? They wanna know that it fits neatly into a month. You know, a certain month, oh it's three months? Cool, I got three months to spend. If it was a 13 week program, <laughs> same contents, you know, with an extra week, people would be like, nah, that doesn't, I don't like the way that looks. So, yeah. That's interesting though, isn't it? Like if I put up the same program but put 13, I don't know what would happen. Yeah, I think it'd be interesting to see how many people don't buy it because it <laughs> makes them feel weird. <laughs> you kind of answered it in that one, but what are your general, what do you see usually for 
how often you have to switch exercise variations for the like the repeat about effect to limit the stress that that exercise is applying, applying to them? It's very individualized depending on how sensitive or resistant somebody is. So the more resistant they are, I, I cycle them more often. Uh, so every every third week, that would be the example of that, which is a high revolving door. Most of the time, I'll I'll do it every time the block has to change. Like if for somebody who's sensitive, right? So basically, someone could run like a, a volume or type base block for six. Let's say let's call it eight weeks and see progress until that eighth week. I'm not changing any of the exercises until we you know after we gave when I found that they plateaued. At which point, I'm going to pivot to either peaking or to a different type of training. At which point I would change exercises. If I'm peaking, I'm decreasing the exercise variety, right? I'm just gonna drop it to almost none. Um, like, uh, do you think the RPE is a useful tool for novices? And I, I wonder if you would modify the linear progression to be more in line with your paradigm, like increasing the bench press, I mean the bench press and the press, the frequency, and just increasing the overall volume of the deadlift. Yeah, so I do think that RPE, rate of perceived exertion, and or RIR, reps in reserve, could be used effectively in a motivated, educated, novice population. I think having a coach to help them through that will probably be useful as well, not to mark the RPEs or the reps in reserve for them, but to give them feedback when they say, say, yeah, this is an RPE seven, right? You don't tell them it's an eight or a nine or it's less than a seven. You say, so what you're saying here is that you could have only done four more reps, just to confirm, right? And so that way they're learning kind of on the on the fly. So yeah, and I think that would help cut the learning curve off when they're gonna use it later. But I think that's fine. If you're asking off right now for a barbell medicine novice program, what would it look like? Well, I'm glad you asked. So <laughs> <laughs> you would start, it'd be four reps on the squat at RPE eight, <laughs> one set to your first workout. And then you do the press for a set of four at RPE eight, and then deadlift for a set of four at RPE eight. The second workout would be squat, four at RPE eight, and then you'd bench press four at RPE eight, and then you'd uh, do rows for four at RPE eight. Why fours? Because they're not fives. Why <laughs> RPE? This rip off. And so then what you do is alternate that workout, and then week two, you would add a set. It'd be two sets of four. And then after week two, week three, you'd add a third set. So about three sets of four, RP eight, right? And then I'd probably hold a person there for uh, as long as the weight's going up. And then I may add another set. And then I may continue to do that, some, some similar type of process, until I need to change exercises, rep range, something like that. At which point they're no longer novice. Uh, so yeah, we may write a book, and it'll be red in color and it'll have Tron, the character, on the cover, squatting. <laughs> and it'll be, it won't be starting strength. What, what, what we call it? Beginning strength? Beginning power. Yeah, yeah. Uh, evidence-based strength. These things are <laughs> yeah, evidence-based we'll strength. that for a little bit. Yeah. Something. But that's probably what I would do. I, I don't actually think that the frequency or the volume is actually wrong in the novice LP. I just think that if you're using that rigid paradigm and you don't allow for expansion of that based on how you're responding, then yeah, it's gonna end up being not enough stress. Whereas I would like to have freely manipul manipulatable variables that, uh, that you have a, a, like a legend almost to a map. Like okay, so my bench is no longer responding to this, what do I need to do? Well add another set, or add a single prior, or add some variety, you know, and here's where we would start. So you just have a key. It's your key. It's your programming key. And with that paradigm, you're already set up to believe that you need more stress as you go on. You don't become hyper obsessed with recovery and shoot yourself in the foot from that standpoint. Right. And and you're not locking yourself into hyper specificity right off, you know, forever. You're saying, I'm trying to develop some complex motor patterns I have no previous experience with. And when I have evidence that's no longer working, okay, and I've had some experience with these things, I have to change. That, I mean, you're setting up all the right paradigms for long-term programming success. So that's what our novice LP would look like. And it, again, Red Book, Tron would be on the front, squatting, and we'll come up with a good name. Yeah. Acquiring strength. Acquiring strength, mm -hmm. yes. Acquiring, yeah. Accumulating strength, of like course. Beyond production, strength, RX. <laughs> strength RX. Yeah, strength RX, I like that. Yeah. All right.
All right, fine. We'll write it. It'll be on April Fools, sumo deadlifts, high bar squats, four straps on the bench press, all fours and RPE. Uh, so for programming yourself, um, you talked to a bit earlier about when you're programming for a large group of people, you start changing variables to see how things affect. Is there any merit to doing that yourself on your own program if you were programming yourself? I mean, I didn't understand the question. So basically, it, it, like you're trying things out for yourself. Or is yeah. the sample size of one person too small to well, really? But you're most well, concerned about your sample yeah, size. You right? don't care about anybody else. <laughs> yeah, yeah so you're yeah. selfish like that. The issue is having, well, you have to have enough training experience amassed such that you're fairly confident that your one change is responsible for the outcome that you get. And there's quite a bit of learning curve in kind of figuring this whole thing out. So I mean, my biggest recommendation for anybody is, uh, to the extent you can, is to hire a coach to help cut that learning curve off. Now, the biggest problem is there's not enough coaches to go around for that. There's, a bunch of, there's plenty of coaches to go around who will take your money, but there are not enough coaches to go around uh, who will do that for you. Um, so, in any event, yes, tweaking variables is part of like learning how to do this, and you know we've all made mistakes, and that's that's why we're all better for it. So. Are you guys going to eventually do certification for coaches? Yeah, yeah. The idea is you'd come right now. I mean, we have to flesh all this out. The idea would be you come to some a seminar like this, right? Take it. You have to pass the test, and then you'd have to go to one of our training camps and show that you can coach the lifts with the people at the training camp. That'd be the idea, not right now, but. Yeah, so then we got this book thing, and this certification thing, and this like up to date thing, and then like he's married, so you know, there's that thing. Planning some online education stuff based on fleshing out some of the things yeah. I lectured about in further detail. Sweet. So, like I said, I got Instagram Lives to do, so <laughs> important. Sorry. Not that uh, guy. Uh, so, in regards to pain, uh, tendonitis is a super popular one. Yeah. I know that you guys answered kind of off the cuff, just through social media without going through the sure. pain lecture. Right. Okay. So would your answer to tendonitis through the elbows on the squat be a little bit different besides just change your grip? Because now that's... I've been answering a lot of questions on our forum about this recently. So the recommendations for elbow pain on the low bar squat seem to have, uh, I'd say, varied over the years. Sometimes they're like, jam your elbows down more under the bar or jack your elbows up higher or... You know, yeah, I wrote a bar, bar. I know. I don't write the elbow problem thing, but at I, the end, there's a rec whole thing. Yeah. Here's what I've been telling people. I'll let you talk about your recommendations. Okay. So here's something that maybe we give different recommendations on. So uh, tendonitis, tendinopathy is super annoying. I have it all the time in this elbow. The people's elbow. Yes. <laughs> um, among other places. And so tendonitis, tendinopathy results from a, it's a degenerative process, disorganization of the tendon that comes when there's repeated cyclical loading at too high of a dose over time. So what I try to do for people when they have it in the squat is to, I, I kind of, it's ideal when I'm coaching them in person, but sometimes I can explain it from afar. But I get them to set up, unrack the bar, and I try to have them pay attention to, if they could give me some vague estimate, or pay attention to where is the weight being held when they have unracked the bar. Very often, people will unrack, say, 135, and they can feel there's some compressive loading in their arms, okay? That very commonly precipitates this situation. The more of the weight that you have unracked in the low bar position and you are holding in your arms, the more likely, in my experience, you are to develop issues at the elbow. So when I can get people to unload their forearms in the low bar squat, effectively I tell them, hey, imagine you're gonna unrack 135. I want as close to 135 pounds of that weight to be on your back and not in your arms. Your hands are just there, hold it in place on your back, not to hold the bar up. I don't want 50 of those 135 pounds to be transmitted through your arms. I want 130 pounds to be on your back and then five pounds, sure, whatever to hold the bar in place. When I can get people to do that, to support the weight on their back and not in their arms, pain tends to improve. If they are so hypersensitive in the elbows because they've been 
told that if you don't high bar or low bar squat, you're a pussy and you're gonna lose all your gains. And That's they're true. just forcing it over and over and over again, and their elbows are just like feel like they're beyond repair. Say, so, hey, roll it up, high bar squat for a few sessions, desensitize things, and then when we go back to the low bar position, bars on your back, not in your arms. We additionally talk about experimenting with thumbs over, thumbs around, grip width, things like that. But the main thing that I have come to start recommending is to unload the forearms in this situation. Because people, I mean, you'll have people who are, maybe they're standing even too upright when they unrack the low bar squat, and the bar, which is down low on their back, they're standing upright. It's basically being held, their whole arm and elbows in direct compression under the bar. So it's like, hey, unload the arms a little bit, get the weight on your back, just support it in place. Things tend to get better. Cool. That makes sense for your clients too. Um, I would notice it most when doing pin squats because I'm loading all the weight onto the bar and then having to drive up. So then it feels better when you unload and then you reload it and it feels better? Or what do you On the way down, I don't feel it at all, but right after coming up uh -huh. and racking, it's like, holy shit. <laughs> yeah. I've done it. So. Anything to add? I wrote an article about this. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll look up your article. Be mad. <laughs> it's just, oh yeah, maybe my recommendation is different. It's like the last four paragraphs, you just like, ugh. You just recited. Okay. I had the same problem with the spot, so I know what you're talking about. Yeah, cool. It's worse. Nice. But the art, I mean, obviously you yeah. fixed it, so I I'm just mad. read the art. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not mad, I'm disappointed. <laughs> All right. Now nobody go on the internet and start us, and get us in a fight, okay? I don't deal with this shit. All right. We're still friends with the starting strength folks. We don't have to be in a fight. We disagree with them on some key things. And I feel like we're good enough friends where we can, you know, jab at each other. But at the same time, we do disagree fundamentally about some things. And that's fine. But well, we think it's fine anyway. But whatever. Cool? So nobody needs to go on the starting strength forum and be like, those, those guys at the Barbell Medicine Center, they said this, that, and the other. Yeah, they know. That's why we left. Got it. <laughs> they know. All right, thanks for coming, guys. <clears throat>
like health outcomes to me is, is really fascinating actually. I feel probably the seminar was probably the pain, pain uh, lecture. Uh, growing my knowledge bank as a strength and conditioning coach when you think you know things and you come to this you're going to find out that maybe you don't and that you're going to learn a lot more and help as many people as possible so thanks guys. Well I learned a ton. Uh, definitely the pain stuff wasn't something I was expecting like just how much I didn't know about that. Hey, my favorite part of the seminar was interacting with all the individual coaches. They all have their own particular style, their own particular way of teaching, and getting to rotate through the coaches gives you a really good, I guess, perspective and look at ways to improve each of the lifts. Head over to the barbellmedicine.com website and register today. Look at, look at this, look at this man. What a savage. <laughs> you or what? No, it's just the admiring. The beard admiring. No, I should sign up for culinary school. Oh yeah? Yeah. And on day one I said, I'm gonna join the Marine Corps. <laughs> so I left. That was my favorite. Is that true? Actually, listening to your interview with Omar and Mike worth it. Uh Leah Lutz is our resident chef. A actual chef. I guess I didn't get the memo to wear a barbell medicine shirt today. Like barbell medicine, barbell medicine. Thrall's got barbell medicine. Uh, Vanessa's never, she just defected. She's not actually a part of the thing. Tom, that is a barbell medicine nipple. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> got it.